Usually, uh, there's there's a couple different models. Um, the the common one for independence is you complete your film, you play the festival circuit, and you woo the distributors at that point. Okay. Less commonly, uh, and you know the whole reason for going in festivals is you win awards, distributors notice you, they think oh there's a possibility. So film festivals like Cannes or Toronto or Berlin um, or not so much the queer festivals but um, there's those those large festivals also function with an active market component so they are um, distributors are actively bidding on films Sundance maybe is the, the best known in the states um, in terms of having a, an active viable market Sundance is probably for independence, the most important uh, festival in the States. And uh, certainly, I believe Pariah first played there and signed there. Um, whereas Cannes, of course, was where Blue is the Warmest Color got launched. Um, these festivals tend to be pretty um, supportive of queer content. Uh, and certainly, f queer films have done well in all these four festivals I've mentioned. Um, the second model is, which I've used, um, is that you, you secure a distributor uh, before you go to camera. So it's part of your financing. The distributor um, fronts in advance. So I was with Alliance the two times I did it. Uh, three times I did it was with Alliance um, and then one time with Cineplex. These are large Canadian distributors with international arms. Um, and uh, they were able to put in financing early and in turn trigger uh, government investment from uh, Government of Canada, Telefilm Canada. So for, for four features where I had Telefilm financing, that was triggered by having a distributor on board. So those are the two models. Um, it's, uh, each has its pluses and minuses. Um, money always comes with um, uh, interference, so you have to go in with your eyes open knowing you're inviting the distributor into the edit room to tell you how to make your film. Not so much fun, but it's, it, it becomes, um, sometimes it's a choice and sometimes it's uh, the only way you can get the film financed. The biggest shift that's happened, of course, in the last 10 years is online distribution and viewer-on-demand distribution. So not just Netflix, but all forms of online access from Pirate Bay to, uh, you know, various uh, sketchier forms to, you know, mainstream pay-on-demand. I guess um, Amazon uh, and YouTube are both, big, pardon me, Amazon and... Um, uh, yeah, are, they're, they're, they're becoming very viable in terms of uh, pay-as-you-go. Um, more and more, as, as theaters, as the number of theaters shrink um, and the, the costs involved in distribution uh, grow exponentially, not so much the, the technical cost of a projector or a, a print, but more the, the advertising costs. Um, and it's harder and harder to lure audiences to a theater for a standard run release. You can lure audiences for festivals. They're proven time and again. Certainly in New York, there's 100 plus festivals. Um, some, something different every week, whether it's by nationality or theme. I know there's what, three queer festivals now in, in New York? There's Mix, there's New York Gay Festival. I can't remember. Um, there's a, there's a, an even more underground one than Mix. Those are really worth checking out. And I think those are incredibly... The festival circuit, the queer festival circuit, is probably the single most important way to get work out and get it seen and have audiences uh, really connect with it. Theatrical remains extremely difficult, maybe even more so. A couple of my films are with Strand, who is a big queer distributor based in California. Oh, yeah. Um, 
So Strand has been a real leader and recognized in the industry for pioneering queer distribution, but uh, it's an uphill battle. And that might be an interesting, I don't know how far your research can go, but um, that might be interesting to look at their website, look at their model, uh, see if see if they'd be open to um, engaging in some, you know, sharing some trade secrets. Because uh, they, I have a huge amount of respect for them, and they've certainly tried to weather the storms and keep moving, keep moving forward. But it's it's harder and harder. DVD distribution is just about over, um, so it's it's either uh, online or. Online and festivals tend to be the most viable ways for independent independent feature directors now. Your film, not so much fun, but it's it it becomes um, sometimes it's a choice and sometimes it's uh, the only way you can get the film financed. The best example I know of that is with Queer as Folk. I don't know if you remember that TV series. Yeah. Uh, I directed a bunch of episodes for it. One of the things that was so interesting was that the primary target audience uh, showcase, showcase or showtime, showtime, showcase is Canada, showtime is US. Showtime was courting primarily a female audience, a female straight demographic for queer as folk. And it was the it's it was the eye candy. It was the taboo. Certainly, there was a big, a large, uh, gay men's audience, but and a small lesbian audience. For the most part, it was marketed to a straight female demographic. Um, I think, you know, we see uh, that there was an interesting uh, fan base for the L word. Um, where there was an acknowledgement that all sorts of, you know, guys and gals, especially teens, were tuning into uh, the L word again and twenty somethings, and again it was it wasn't just driven by lesbian demographic. It was broader than that, um, and that didn't take away from, in both cases, the series speaking to gay communities, lesbian communities, but. It's inevitable that as, you know, as queer goes mainstream, um, the mainstreaming of queers through gay marriage, gays in the military, there's also a mainstreaming of the, the stories and the worlds. And as more and more people find it part of their worlds, as normalization occurs, this is, of course, what activists like, uh, like me tend to get very critical about, um, and ask questions about, um, then then the interest is broader. Um, straight guys will tune into a gay series and not feel threatened or nervous. Uh, you know, I think long before that, straight girls felt very comfortable watching lesbian content and identifying mm-hmm. without, you know, quit. it wasn't about their own sexuality, it was about a story they cared about. And it was a story that they could relate to in terms of friends, family, and also feelings themselves. I think more and more a new generation, as, as, as the walls get knocked down and the doors get open, people don't categorize so, um, so carefully anymore and people are interested in a good story. I think, yes, it's normalization. Yes, there's... Um, very important critiques of uh, not just homo normalization, but homo nationalism, um, as uh, as LGBT issues move more and more into the mainstream, as queer issues become more and more assimilated and compromised. There's there's a phenomena of co-optation that's hugely important to criticize, but equally, I think there's also interesting things that happen where everybody starts. A new generation, uh, 20-somethings, feel ownership of queer stories and in a connection to queer stories and unproblematically uh, to speak about it as part of their world, whatever their own sexuality. So things are different. Uh, there's pluses and minuses. It's, yeah. a, it's a very interesting world we live in where things are galloping fast. 
there's the, that distinction between art cinema, which is where um, minority voices tend to be lumped, like whether it's queer or black or Latina or Arab cinema, that tends to be called world cinema slash art cinema. And then, and then of course, the mainstream talks about Spider-Man. So uh, I think, um, nevertheless, there's... There's I, one of the one of the courses I teach here in, at my university is a course on the rise of new neorealism, and I, films like Pariah use the techniques of neorealism. You know neorealism, right? The the um, like sort of gritty slice of life, oh, yeah. real, you know, very much almost documentary in terms of both story and character and. Um, a lack of melodrama, a lack of big, a lack of action, a lack of, you know, just ordinary life observed, well observed. There's an excitement around it that's growing. Um, more and more filmmakers embrace it as a way to tell their own stories, stories that oh, yeah. are ignored. I think strategies of neorealism speak both to economic marginalization, anyone is marginalized, speak to anyone is marginalized because of race, gender, sexuality, region. Um, <clears throat> for global cinema, uh, neorealism has been a huge, um, it, it's very viable, both because it tends to be easier to make, cheaper and easier to make. You're shooting with available light, you're shooting with a tiny crew, maybe you're shooting with your DSLR, um, so your and your crew is three people and or two people plus your actors. It, it, the, the ability it's it's the, it's the equivalent. It's the high end version of shooting a film with your cell phone. So it's very viable to make work. And then these stories, there's a hunger for them. There's an interest. We're all interested in, or hopefully we should be more interested in each other's life, whether it's. Um, a Mexican story, or a Thai story, or a Greenland story. Um, there's there's specific lives that we don't that Hollywood doesn't give us much visiting okay. rights to. So um, this makes the big difference. One of the things that I found most interesting is, in terms of this question of distribution, is that more and more we're not looking to, as filmmakers and as audiences, we're not looking to the theaters to serve us anymore. We're looking to online primarily. I, I would say, you know, like teaching, um, you know, both both uh, thinking about both my daughters who are in their late teens and then to, for uh, my students who are in their late teens, early 20s, they don't go to the movies. Oh, that's you know, interesting. They, they just, they, like the idea of slapping down 12 bucks is just like nope, not going to happen because they'll get it on. They'll watch it. They 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 watch you know everything online. Yeah. I, I don't know if this uh, rings a bell, but it's meant that we can't even when I'm teaching film and when I'm talking about distribution, we're not talking ever about theatrical. We're talking about festivals. We're talking about online. We used to talk about DVD. We're talking about special projects sometimes. Um, there's there's wonderful initiatives where it's halfway between releasing uh, it, it's one off releasing so they'll pick up a hundred titles and release them to college campuses they'll pick up a hundred titles and release them to small towns and create a monthly cine club um, I'm I'm part of an amazing initiative I'll send you a link if you're interested. It's 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 a, it's an incredible. It's one of the most um, successful distribution models I've ever seen anywhere. I think it's there's a hundred chapters um, based on college, college and university campuses, mostly in Canada, but also international. They release something. It's called Cinema Politica, and the focus is new activist cinema, which includes a lot of queer stuff, a lot of. Uh, gender stuff, smart, trans stuff, really, like, amazing, inspiring. They get out, uh, the typical model is uh, monthly screenings, sometimes some do weekly. In Montreal, they do weekly screenings and get 500 people out a week. Mm. It's just, the screenings are free. 
Huh? So they're getting their audiences out. Um, they always throw in uh, speakers to talk about the issues. The filmmakers come and speak. And so nobody's getting rich off it, but it means your, your film, your low-budget activist film, mostly documentary but some dramas too, are being seen by tens of thousands of people.